Tonight on Q2, thinning trees. Fred Lodge may soon look different, undergoing major wildfire prevention efforts. Plus limbs for Leon. Fishing and hunting, yeah, so I gotta learn how to do all that again. It'll be a little different, but we'll be all right. Fundraising efforts underway for a Billings man after he's recovering from losing an arm and a leg in a motorcycle crash. And an engineering marvel. It was the tallest dam in the world for a very short period of time. I'll take you out and about to the Buffalo Bill Dam. The MTN 530 News starts right now. From Montana's news leader, this is the MTN 530 News. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Russ Reesinger. And I'm Andrea Lutz. Tonight, a push to prevent scenes like this one. Well, of course, this was Red Lodge just three years ago when the Robertson Draw fire burned eerily close to town. Yeah, that fire burned 30,000 acres and went down in history as the state's largest human-caused wildfire of that season. And now with a new wildfire season approaching, the Forest Service is unveiling new efforts to make sure history doesn't repeat itself. Our Diane Parker begins our coverage. There's no question Red Lodge, Montana has dynamic views. Oh, well, those views, they've changed over the years due to natural disasters like wildfires and floods. The views are about to change once again. This time, it's a proactive project aimed at protecting the ski mountain and the city. Really, the easiest way to define it is we look west here. You can see most of the treatments start up in the forested stands. I call it for forested stands. So as we look towards Red Lodge Mountain, you can kind of see the meaning of the forest. Just above that forest line is where the public portion of the Red Lodge Mountain Fuel Reduction Project starts, with tree thinning surrounding Red Lodge Mountain and up the west fork of Rock Creek towards Wild Bill Lake. The goal, protecting Red Lodge and its economic driver from devastating wildfires. If we have no trees, we have no business. A Red Lodge is a pretty windy place and we need wind breaks. We can always build new lifts or buildings, but we can't build a new forest. Yeah. Our payroll is over four million bucks and our economic impact to the county is pushing eight million dollars. So. We want to keep the forest healthy. Red Lodge Mountain Ski Area and a few private ranches on the back side of the mountain make up the private portion of this tree thinning wildfire mitigation project with a total of 600 acres treated since 2022. This would be part of their project. You look over there. That's the boundary. Yeah. But raging wildfires like the 2021 Robertson Draw Fire near Red Lodge have no bounds. And that has the Forest Service scheduled to thin 1,900 acres of forest starting in 2025 once official approval is granted in August. It's a project Beartooth Ranger District Amy Haas says is much needed. The Forest Service has done an amazing job of suppressing fire over the last hundred years with uh, the Smoky Bear campaign and putting fires out before 10 a.m. With that, there's just dense vegetation. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. And thanks to this collaborative project, if a fire sparks, it should be more easily contained and safer for first responders. Our crews at Red Lodge Fire Rescue, which work with the Forest Service, we have the same objective, and that is improve forest health, health and reduce wildfire risk. It's going to give our community a chance to not only withstand another fire event, but to survive it and uh, really get through it in a successful manner. In Red Lodge, Diane Parker, MTN News. And you are invited to attend a public meeting tonight to learn more about those fuel reduction projects. It's happening just about 30 minutes from now at 6 p.m. at the Roosevelt Center on South Broadway Avenue. Communities that have limited resources but face a high risk of wildfire danger will get additional support from the U.S. government. The Forest Service awarded $250 million in community wildfire defense grants, with $5.3 million going to the northern region. Here in Montana, Park County will receive some of that money to respond to risk reduction strategies. Missoula and Sanders counties in western Montana also receive some of that money. Right now, there are already two small active wildfires burning in Montana, and the state has seen seven spark this week alone. There's fear those numbers will only increase in coming weeks. Meteorologist Jason Stiff joins us now, and we're running out of time to get snow in the mountains. How does the snowpack look? 
Uh, the numbers are not where we would like them to be this time of year. You can see behind me all the numbers for the various basins around both Montana and northern Wyoming. Northern Wyoming doing better. Most places between about 90% and 115% of average. These are the water equivalents of all the snow up there. But in much of Montana, most places between 45 and 85% of where it should be in the middle of May. Now the good news is we do have some more clouds moving our direction. Some areas of rain right now, but there is a cold front sweeping toward Montana and Wyoming. Wyoming. That means better chances for some rain, thunderstorms, and even some very high elevation snow, mainly above 9,000 feet. But that wind is something we're not going to want, and we don't want it to raise the fire danger. More details on what you expect for the next seven days coming up in my complete forecast. A decision today could have major implications for the future of coal strips power plants. The United States Bureau of Land Management announced it'll end federal coal leasing in the Powder River Basin. It's the largest coal producing region in the United States. It's also where coal strip gets most of its coal. BLM leaders say environmental findings show significant impacts to climate and health environments from leasing 6 billion tons of coal. A Billings man is looking forward to one day getting back on his motorcycle after a crash last summer that left him a double amputee. And his story is drawing awareness for a special fundraiser this weekend called Limbs for Leon. Our Kelsey Boggs caught up with the man, his wife, and his care team to discuss his incredible journey over the past 10 months. The accident happened just 14 miles outside of Billings when Leon was struck head on by a semi truck. Now, just 10 months later, he's on the mend, making an extraordinary recovery. I don't have any, any recollection of that day. The trauma of Leon Hushka's accident last July has been wiped from his memory. It's just weird that, you know, I can't remember how even the day started. He was traveling to Helena on his motorcycle to meet up with his wife, Michelle. I left town at about 6.30 and I still hadn't heard from him. Usually when he's on his motorcycle, when he stops for fuel, he'll text me and just tell me where he's at. Michelle grew increasingly worried after not hearing from Leon. No, I had a bad feeling. Her instinct was unfortunately spot on. Just 14 miles outside of Billings, Leon was struck head on by a semi truck while traveling 75 miles per hour. Nobody was to blame. It was nobody's fault. And it was just a tragic moment in a day. Michelle's brother was able to track Leon down at Intermountain Health. He was just coming out of a four hour surgery. He lost his leg at the scene. My family arranged for somebody to drive me back from Helena because I was in no state to drive. His injuries were extensive. He was in critical condition. He was uh, in hemovolemic shock, so he had lost a lot of blood. He had sustained a traumatic amputation of the lower extremity and severe mangled left upper extremity. Dr. Brian Drake and his team at Ortho Montana took on the case. We were able to get him rapidly up to the OR and uh, control his bleeding and obtain hemostasis and started stabilizing his injuries. He remained in the ICU for 25 days in a coma and was then transferred down to the general floor of the hospital to continue his recovery before moving on to rehabilitation. He never lost hope of recovery. His work ethic is amazing, so that, that sets a foundation as well. But this January, a difficult decision had to be made to amputate Leon's left arm after his pain persisted. He was then fitted with a robotic prosthetic arm that he's now working on getting used to. Open up for me. This Saturday, Limbs for Leon at Metro Park will take place, an attempt to assist Leon with the cost of his prosthetics. This is something we are able to do for them and pay them back for their generosity and kindness of staff. Something that means the world to Leon, who credits much of his recovery to his support system. I think I owe it to him to work hard and, and get back to get back to normal. And he's looking forward to getting back to doing what he loves most. Fishing and hunting, yeah, so I gotta learn how to do all that again. It'll be a little different, but we'll be all right. In Billings, Kelsey Boggs. MTN News. Tonight's Out and About takes us just outside Cody, Wyoming to the Buffalo Bill Dam. When it was completed in 1910, it was considered an engineering marvel. And as I found out, more than a century later, it is still a sight to see, as well as an important provider of power and irrigation water. Out and About is sponsored by Garden Avenue Greenhouse and Garden Center. It was the tallest concrete arch dam in the world when it was completed in 1910. Called an engineering marvel, the dam originally stood at 325 feet, but was later extended 25 more. And at that time, it was the tallest dam in the world. The view from the top is nothing short of spectacular. To the west, the Buffalo Bill Reservoir. To the east, visitors can look down 280 feet into the Shoshone River. The dam itself is a testimony to American ingenuity and backbreaking labor. 
That history on display at the visitor center. And it's a very interesting story about how the dam was built and the struggles that they encountered back in the day. And there were a lot of struggles. Everything was done by hand, pickaxe. A river had to be diverted, a canyon walled off. There were labor shortages and strife. It was hard and dangerous work. Seven uh, workers did lose their lives. But five years later, Buffalo Bill Dam, first known as Shoshone Dam, was complete. And it would change the future of this area. There was a um, government direction to get people to come to the West. And to do that, people had to be able to have water so they could farm and survive. So that was the originating thought, really, of building this project. Some power is produced, but most importantly, the water from this dam irrigates around 93,000 acres of farmland in the Bighorn Basin. The Buffalo Bill Dam is on the National Register of Historic Places. It is also recognized as a national civil engineering landmark. Just the fact that they were able to accomplish this so long ago, that in and of itself is impressive, what they did back then and then what they've done since in preserving the history of what went into this. And not just this, the dam itself, but uh, just all of the information about the local area was very informative as well. More than a century after it was constructed, the Buffalo Bill Dam remains an engineering marvel with an incredible story behind it. The Visitor's Center is open May through September. There's no charge to visit. Looks like fun. Still to come on the MTN 530 News on Q2, fresh from the farm. The farmer's market helping to open up new possibilities for consumers. And off and running in Billings will take you back to the Special Olympics Summer Games opening ceremonies. Stay with us.